All right. Well, thanks for uh, joining us for the consortia special interest group. I think uh, we'll start with uh, just a few in introductions before we get into things. I know most of you, but uh, but my name is Bob Benhoff. I am the manager of AspenCat, uh, which is a consortium of mostly rural libraries of all types in Colorado. I'm Lauren Denny. I work with a international consortium of libraries um, around the world, but I am based in North Carolina. So. I'm Nelson Pretzel. I um, have been working with a two library consortium in South Africa since 2009 using Koha and now it's in a transition and I'm interested to try and continue the, the consor consortial work on a multi-country basis. Cool. Um, I'm Michael Adamic. I'm um, the technology manager at the Central Kansas Library System. And we have 52 um, public and school libraries that are part of our consortium here. I'm Jason, and I know how to unmute, really. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm the Seek and Find Coordinator uh, here in Southeast Kansas. Um, we have a consortium of 49 libraries. We're 48 publics and one community college. I think our official count is up to 152 now, <laughs> which is- And that's, that's why you're in charge of this group. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we uh, yeah we we find the landmines of being too big for sure. Um, so was there anything anybody in particular wanted to uh, chat about today? I know there's things like uh, the 2011 and that sort of stuff we can talk about, but I just wanted to open up and see if anybody had anything particular they wanted to uh, dig into. Um, our consortium is trying to figure out if we want to use the RSS feeds in Koha. Is anyone else using those? Or know where I can go to find out information? <laughs> we use them a little bit. So my catalogers use them to keep track of new items coming in. Uh -huh. Um, that's really our, our large use case. And then my, um, my super user patrons like like to use them because we can tell <laughs> that they're using them because they immediately put their holds on right after something gets added. Um, I don't know. There may be some documentation in the manual. You you do have to have like a separate RSS feed reader. Um, for us, we're just using like a plugin, a Chrome plugin or a Firefox plugin, and then. Any yeah. search you do in the OPAC can be turned into um, an RSS feed. So you're putting your filters in that way. Um, and if you sort it by accession date newest, then, then you're getting the newest stuff first. So that's how, that's our main use case for them. I wanna uh, welcome Rochelle to the, the interest group. Uh, hi Rochelle, how's it going? Uh, good. Good morning. Can you introduce yourself real quick? We've, we've, that's basically all we've done other than talk about RSS feeds for 30 seconds. <laughs> okay. Um, I am just waking up, so my camera will stay off. Um, I'm in uh, San Juan Batista, California, part of MOBAC, and uh, we have been looking at doing consortia within MOBAC for the last, well, pre-COVID, I'll say nine months. And uh, we were supposed to kind of be part of it already, but it's been delayed. So I just thought I'd join the group here to see what to expect in the future. So are you, uh, so there, there's an existing consortia that you're looking at joining? Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Uh, no, there's one that we are interested in beginning. Uh, beginning, with, okay. Yes, yeah. So um, I won't know many of the definitions of things that you say, but I just want to start getting familiar with it. So um, 
I do know what's going on in the future. Okay. Well, feel free to ask a lot of questions. Are you uh, looking at Koha in particular? Uh, we currently have Koha. You do. Okay. So you yeah, and like so to do the. That. Yeah, yeah, and it's all the other. I think there's eight other libraries that are interested in doing it. Mm -hmm. Um. So. That's cool. Just are you kidding. supported? Sorry, I'm asking so many questions. <laughs> uh, supported as in? Like you have a hosting company, like we I we use Bywater, for example. Oh, yes. Bywater yeah. is also ours, yes. Okay, so yeah, that would, uh, they would be able to combine those, I think, uh, not without some difficulty, but uh, that sounds a lot more doable than if you were all on different systems trying to pull everything together. Oh, definitely. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think it should go smoothly. I know uh, on my part, I've just been, we are a very small library, um, less than 10,000 um, pieces. Um, so I'm just cleaning up our database because it, it, over the last 10 years, we've migrated to at least three different ILS and each time bad data came over. So um, yeah, just keeping it as clean as possible. When I ordered new library cards, I made sure it began with our zip code just to possibly make it a little bit easier down the road. Um, things like that to, to ease the process. Yeah, I've been involved in many, many migrations and uh, that often doing data cleanup before is really wise. So it's good that you're doing that. Hopefully you're, the other interested libraries are doing some of that as well. Uh, it's going to help that you, if you're all staying within Koha, there's not some of that translation loss of data uh, that is pretty typical when you're moving from one system to another. So that'll be helpful. But um, I, I, th I think the thing, I guess you you would have to think about as a group is just how you're going to do the setup because Koha offers a lot of flexibility in consortial setup. Um, so, so that just making those decisions is probably going to be the biggest discussion you'll need to have. Yeah, and we haven't really had any discussions in like 18 months, but it feels like things are starting to kind of open a little bit more and we'll probably get into meeting again uh, in the next six months or so. Excellent. That's cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Nelson, I feel like you had unmuted to say something a little earlier. Well, no, also, there was a speaker in the background of the, the intercom, so I was kind of muting and unmuting. But uh, yeah, I have some real burning questions, but yeah, go for it. I've just kind of been sitting back. I've watched the, the recordings from the previous uh, meetings and I know there was a conference here in Colorado. Uh, so one of the um, uh, ongoing questions I have relates to, I, I saw a video about the Aspen, uh, by, the Bywater uh, hosted on their site. And that, um, in terms of the, dis the discovery layer. Yeah. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's a poor man's way to do consortial work. One of my questions is whether there's a poor man's way to do consortial um, uh, front end with just Koha. And um, if not, and I don't think there is because my requirements kind of continue to grow, but um, you know, is ViewFind an option? Um, is, um, is Aspen uh, going to be uh, open source? So poor, it poor is guy, open source. So, yeah, but su such that a poor man could come in and try to self DIY, you know, work with it without a, a, a world of effort. And yeah, then, that that's a good question. Um, if you so that, email me, I can put you in contact with uh, Biowater's lead developer. Uh, so I'll just drop my email in the chat. Okay. Uh, uh, and he might have a better sense of that uh, because uh, the, the Aspen discovery is open source. So the code is published. How easy that is to do an install, I have no idea. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. But uh, he would probably be able to give you a little bit more of a sense. I know that it's starting, uh, PTF, uh, PTFS Europe is starting to do some support. Uh, so that's another supported thing, but there that it, it is starting to grow where there's more than just Bywater supporting this particular iteration of ViewFind. I see. Um, yeah, and I've been to the ViewFind site too, and it looks like there's a lot of people who are really jacked 
about viewfind, but I'm not really sure. It's kind of like um, some of the CMSs where they say, yeah, this is easy, but actually it's not so easy. So I didn't, and then the fact that um, there's the app. So to do um, international consortial work and not have to configure SMS notifications across multiple countries, seems like it'd be better handled with an app. So the Lita is something that, you know, is appealing from that standpoint. And I didn't see uh, an app. I don't know, maybe there's some apps developed relating to ViewFind, but I haven't. So I, haven't, I know there were, yeah. They're, they've worked on um, a app for Aspen Discovery. So I yeah. we haven't utilized it yet. And I know uh, some of our, uh, well, I, well, I know Lauren's not on Aspen Discovery, but I, I'm pretty sure the Kansas folks aren't either at this point. Or are you, Michael? You are, yes. okay. Have you messed with the app at all? Not, not a whole lot. Um, it, and that is the Lita app. That, yeah. that Nelson was talking about. Um, that's one of my goals for later later this year. We added Aspen um, in 2020 during the shutdown and I was about three months into my position. And so at that point, it was kind of just get this out there and started. And that was about all I could do. Um, but one of my goals for the end of this year and next year is to really dive dive more into the Aspen side of things and get, get my hands dirty with that. But I don't know a ton about it yet. And so for notifications, it's just email notifications at this point for, for books that are due, overdue. So those are typically generated on the Koha side. On an email basis. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the best way to do that. I mean, that's one, one, of, uh, one of our groups of libraries that's part of our consortium is a group of prison libraries and none of the prisoners have email. So we are still working through trying to figure out how to get email of how to get notifications when the entire system is designed around everybody having email. So that's mm -hmm. been a bit of an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're still kind of working through that. But yeah, uh, that actually works really well on the Koha side for ema emailing out those notifications with the exception that periodically email service providers change what they consider spam and uh, and so every once in a while you have to run through a bunch of hoops to try to get things working again, uh, depending on the service provider. But in general, it works well. We, you know, in the South African in, um, installation, that's, you know, we had the email and I'm sure that, you know, that's a definite, a definite plus. I'm just imagining that younger folks, you know, in their twenties or, or younger, are so connected with their phones that they have a, an, an app where the notification pops up within the app. Seems like it would be more appropriate yeah. to, to, that, to that younger set of people. Uh, there's also a, a text option in Koha. Um, we also use a third party called ShopBomb for some of our libraries to do that. So that's a, another option to uh, kind of uh, make that work more with phones uh, for those type of notifications. As someone who's probably not going to ask anytime soon, I would love to see some sort of like push notification implementation in, in the base code for Koha, but I'm not sure how you would pull that off. Right, and then if you have multiple countries, you've got different, um, you know, shop bomb might not work in South Africa or, or the UK or, you know, something like that, right? Or, or am I misunderstanding? I, I mean, I don't know about all other countries. I know they will set up a local number. So, um, so you, it, it could potentially be a solution. I don't know about other countries. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's basically the guy is named George that does it. It's kind of like a one man shop. Uh, uh, okay. But uh, not that, not George Nichols, but George Quay. <laughs> uh, but uh, he, uh, uh, so I don't know what all the capabilities are, but uh, he, uh, uh, but that's how they've set stuff up for us as they found like a local number. I see. Yeah, and we, we've, we've um, started exploring Twilio and I know Christopher Brandon has done a lot more work with that, but it, it works the same way. Like you purchase a, a number and then they use that number to push out SMS notifications. Um, so I don't know if that would be any different. 
I've asked Christopher repeatedly to talk about Twilio at the uh, conference coming up. Um, now that I've heard about Shop Bum from Bob, maybe Bob and Christopher can talk to each other about doing a joint presentation on Twilio sure. and Shop Bum. Yeah, I could, I could do that. He'd, he'd be happy to participate with you. I can guarantee it. Less work for him. No, I'm just being facetious. He probably, he'd probably welcome it, but it's hard to say. Okay. Well, I'll, yeah. He did already put in that proposal. I checked the form earlier, so he's going to do it. That's good news. I mean, I don't have That's a whole, cool. I, I don't have a whole lot to say about Chat Bomb, uh, but it is another vendor that does that. Any other questions, Nelson? Uh, yeah. So on the settings in Koha and the admin for uh, I forget the terminology now. It's like libraries, systems, and branches or something. Is that something yeah. that y'all? Um, I had trouble getting that to work. I was trying to like, you know, demo it up as though I were different libraries and then log in and then see my, my local holdings. Yeah, um, there's a lot of settings that go into that. So uh, you can have it set up where like branches are independent uh, uh, of each other. So they're all on the same system but you can't only see your stuff for that, uh, for each yeah. branch. So that's one setting that you would, it would be in the, uh, uh, those global settings. And then there's other things you can do where you can see each other's items, but you can partition patrons. Some of that has to do with the permissions you assign the login. So you would, you would have to get your admin settings kind of all squared away the way you wanted them you would have to create the library, then you would have to create a login with the permissions you want for that particular library. And then you could do other things like you could do uh, groups, library groups as well as a feature. Mm -hmm, so, because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we have a few like districts within our consortium. Uh, so they need to be able to have a patron be able to check out at multiple places. So, uh, so that looks a little different uh, so they, they could go to one of those branches within, but if they want to another library in our consortium that wasn't part of that district, they would have to get a new card. So that's how we set it up. There's a lot of different approaches, though. Hmm. Okay. And <laughs> Thank like for, yeah. for us, a lot of that's driven by sharing. So like our big deal is sharing. If you leave independent branches on, that makes sharing between the branches hard. But if you're just trying to kind of collect them together, um, but not necessarily share the collections between the two places, independent branches puts up, independent branches does a lot of things. Um, it puts up a lot of walls and um, it, it really, it has to do with how you want it to function. Um, but that's that's one that we, early on we had it turned on um, and then back in the twos or threes of Koha, the 2.0s or 3.0s of Koha, something broke and we had to turn it off and that um, kind of opened up what the power for us. I see. Well, I, I kind of, the, the basic premise is that I'd like for the the librarians or the ones that would be adding the, the items um, to be able to see pre-existing bib records and attach that, that, are, that were created for other uh, independent branches, I guess. And then to be able to attach their local, their local item uh, to that holding or whatever the, I forget the terminology, but, um, and then for the, for the, on the, front end side on the OPAC side for the for the patron not to be confused about where the items are to just be able to have you know one centric uh, view from their own uh, branch so-called branch I guess or independent library 
So I'm sure there's, it sounds like there's settings aplenty that one could yeah. mm -hmm. configure, configure all that with. Yeah, that's definitely attainable. That's that's what you're describing is essentially what my consortium does uh, with probably some more nuance in some different places, but that's essentially how we have our setup where everybody shares the, uh, the records. And so you just attach your items to existing records. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. uh, but when on our on our Aspen discovery, uh, you're only viewing, well, you can view either the consortium, we can set it up either way, where you view the entire consortium and then have the ability to limit to your branches or the opposite, or just view just those materials that are in your library. And it kind of depends because uh, we have some small schools in our consortium that aren't resource sharing. So they benefit from those records existing when they're cataloging where it's uh they that's can just it. find yep. the record yeah that's but, that's it yeah yeah but they're not their uh their students and faculty are only seeing what's in their facility on the on the patron side of things mm -hmm. and we have it set up and we like i said we don't use aspen so in the the vanilla koha opac you can choose to divide those out into tabs or not so if the patron is logged in at their library, then it's only going to show um, if their library owns it, it'll show that holding separated out. If their library doesn't um, own a copy on that record, then they'll see everybody's holdings. But if they're not logged in, it doesn't know what their library is. So it just shows everybody's holdings. Um, I see. If they're not, if the patron isn't logged in, then they're going to see the, the entire catalog right. for, the, for the, the single install of yeah. Kohan. Okay. They can, the drop down menu, so like our libraries, uh -huh. I can, I, the default is all libraries, but I uh -huh. can choose my library or I can choose a group. So like ours, we have two libraries in the Philippines, so they have their own group. And then we have three libraries in three countries in Africa. So they're East Africa group and West Africa, Africa group. So they can either do their individual library or the group that they're in on the main public site for them to use to just to default to their local library they would have to have to be logged in. Okay, great. And you was that a did that take some configuration? No, uh, I had to set up the groups and tell it what libraries were in each group. And we have independent branches off because we want patrons to share items to share. It was just easier to share everything um, than because uh -huh. it does limit what you can do. Even though they're in different countries, wouldn't you want your local uh, patron to be able to just go down to their local uh, collection? Right now, everyone likes having the ability to see everybody, um, to see where the I, where the material is located. So if so, like a lot of our records, we'll have if it's a book that everybody owns, we'll have like twenty like twenty items on one. Record. Yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> now we do have, and I can't remember We've what got that potential as well we have uh, in the staff interface we do have it turned on where your local library will show up and then all the other libraries is a different tab but i think in the staff interface you'd have to be in your you'd have to be logged in to get that where my library is this and then the second library is the other and everything that you're saying is specific to Koha, uh, there's not no need for Aspen? No, I only have Koha. Uh-huh, uh-huh, okay. We're, we're looking at Aspen because we want to be able to pull resources from outside databases. I want to be able to search JSTOR inside Koha. That's why, and there's some other websites. We would like to be able to search that database inside Koha 
And to my knowledge, Koha does not offer that. Only Aspen offers that. Is that you correct? could load records directly into the catalog, uh, but it wouldn't be quite as smooth. But I would um, have to import. I would have to manually. You would have to do that, yeah. So, you know, there's probably the, the advantages, the main advantages I see to Aspen over the OPAC is uh, the one that Lauren just mentioned where you can you can pull in stuff from other other vendors, other things like that. And there's a variety of ways to do that. Uh, so we have, a, so it all comes under kind of one, a uh, one place you can find, you can find everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one advantage. The other huge advantage is record grouping. Uh, so it makes it, if you have a lot of different, uh, like if you think in a public library in uh, like Tom Sawyer, there's a million different editions. Those could all be on their own different records and uh, that makes a real mess in the catalog. This kind of like folds the accordion and puts, puts them all together, uh, which makes for particularly a large consortium like ours uh, with messy, bad cataloging from, uh, uh, from uh, lots of libraries that used to be independent uh, and it was easy to find their stuff no matter how bad the cataloging was. When you pull that all together, it creates a mess. Uh, so that's, that's another thing. And then it's all, so much more customizable. Uh, there's, uh, uh, you can really get it to look and feel the way you want. And they've added features like Web Builder, where you can basically, like in uh, Uinta in Utah, they're using, they did that instead of went out and got a new website. They just use their, their discovery as their primary website now uh, because it has so much ability to add stuff. So those are some of the advantages. Uh, uh, it also works faster too, which is, you know, depending on the size of your consortium, if you have a small, if you don't have a, a, a huge consortium then things work pretty fast, but uh, like we, when we have like over 60 items on a record, Placing a hold in Koha takes like, it's down to 45 seconds. We just tested yesterday, but it is not fast. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I see. Um, on the topic of record grouping and verbalization, uh, I've been talking with Sam at Uinta um, and he asked me to share it wherever I'm at. So um, he, he did say that he's working on a um, development and a grant through the State Library of Utah. He's trying to get that going to bring um, that to baseline COHAS. Because even with Aspen, um, that's only happening in the OPAC. And it would be nice to be able to do that in the staff client too. Um, so yeah, I was excited about that too. So I'm hoping that that can take off. Um, and I'm thrown out there. I mean, if, if he needs additional funding, I told him that we would definitely be able to throw in on it. We've just never, um, it was like a $20,000 development on the Bywater site. So it was just out of reach. Um, but if he can get that off the ground, I think that would be great for, for baseline Koha. So. And when you say on the staff side, do you mean on the staff side of Aspen? No, on the staff side of Koha. So, uh -huh. um, is there a staff that. side of, of Aspen? No, it's just a patron discovery. Like, I mean, you can. I mean, there's an administrative panel you can get to, but I, I think, uh, sorry to confuse you, know, I, I use the same thing. We're talking to our libraries. We're often like, there's the patron thing here and there's the staff thing here because they often forget like the terminology, what like Koha or Aspen is. Or, so we're always like staff here, patron here. So I, I, I'm assuming that's kind of where <laughs> that was coming from. But yeah, there is a behind the scenes administrative panel on Aspen Discovery. Uh, but um, but this would be adding that very nice uh, record grouping feature to uh, Koha, which would be very welcome. And does does how about in terms of uh the format so if you have an audio or an ebook or a print material does, does koha excuse my newbie uh, question here but does koha handle that or you have to go to aspen to deal with to do that 
Yeah, so call how current it would do that. So right now, the way Aspen functions is it does group together different formats that are considered uh, the same thing. So that would be like a book on CD or a large print version. Uh, it would, but it would distinguish the different formats. Uh, what it doesn't do is it doesn't loop in uh, films into that because that is different enough from uh, the original the original work that uh, that that can be found on uh, not in a grouped record, but uh, everything else is uh, it is pulled together in a way that uh, is kind of more rem reminiscent of if you're looking on Amazon, being able to switch between different formats. Not exactly like that, but a little bit more like that. I put a this link is, in this is an Aspen comment or a or a or a Koha. Um... Uh, front end OPAC comment, Bob. Oh, well, uh, the goal is right now, this is how it works on Aspen. The goal Aspen. would be to okay. make yeah. that work also on Koha. Oh, okay. Just because it's just so much nicer. <laughs> it's much easier to navigate. Like when you have, because we have 600,000 plus records, like, and Again, inconsistent cataloging practices. Like, just if you if you type in Harry Potter, you get a mess uh, on your hands. There's hundreds of results, and they're not organized particularly well. And uh, yeah, that's always my go-to example of like use the discovery layer because it works so much better. Mm -hmm. I see. Aspen, yeah. I see. Thank you. Sure. And yeah, I put in chat the, a link to one of our Aspen catalogs. And so you can kind of go through and if you click on a, a title, it gives you a pop-up and it shows how the different, some of them, the different formats are broken out, but they're still grouped into one into one record. But that's the that's the Aspen, not necessarily Koha. And Aspen would pull together multiple editions. Yeah. They're, all, yes. they're all print. Is yeah, so, a, do, you have, do you have an if, if editions are important to distinguish? Is, are you, do you have an option to sep, keep them separated out? You, you can always ungroup things, but there's a button that says show editions. So if somebody wants okay, to okay, place, okay. They, they basically expand the list. So okay, like I had okay. that Tom Sawyer example. Uh, we have, I think when I looked at one point, we had 55 different editions of Tom Sawyer uh, uh, just because it's in the public domain and anytime somebody buys something, it's probably a new edition. Uh, so all that will be, if you just want to place a hold on the book and you don't care what edition you're getting, you just hit that button. If you do care, you expand that out and then you can look through and place hold on a specific edition. I see. Yeah, I put a link in the chat to our consortium if you want to see how it works in Koha. We've got Great. Two libraries Great. and I think five or six groups. Um, and we have over, I think, I think we're up to like 20 item types. We just added a couple, so I can't remember <laughs> how many we're up to. Um, but all that is filterable. We have added some jQuery and some CSS code. Let me rephrase. I have copied and pasted <laughs> some, some jQuery and CSS code. That's my level of coding languages. Um, that's all I can do. I know my limitations. I let other people like Jason and George write it for me and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not copy and paste. Um, so there are some things that that does affect the searching. Great, okay. And there are a lot of options. For example, there's the, the Koha, um, the jQuery library and things like that. And so if you if you start looking at this stuff and you wonder, is there a way to customize this? Um, it may not be native to Koha, but there are a lot of ways you can customize things um, and and make it do what you want through some, some of that. Uh, right. George? I mean, I know there's... Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, George and Christopher Brandon also do a series of videos uh, with a lot of different ways to manipulate 
uh, Koha using things like jQuery and CSS. Uh, and those are all in the library, but actually watching somebody demonstrate uh, the before and after is highly effective. So that's all on the uh, Koha US uh, website to plug uh -huh. the organization. The Koha community website? Koha US. Oh, okay. But it is definitely free to it's available for anyone. Uh, I, I just put a link in the chat box to the video playlists. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. We move very slowly. So this project ran for over a decade and it cost us $25 a month. <laughs> so, so we we don't really have you know the funding to to pay U.S. prices to, to right. configure to configure things. We worked with a team in India uh, initially to help with the with the install, and um, that may be the way we end up going again if we need extra extra help. Well, I know. Uh, I mean, right now the Aspen uh, uh, Discovery Community is really just starting to grow. It's nothing like Koha where there's so many different options for support. There's so many people that are unsupported and like a, a huge community out there that's global uh, to lean on. So that's building. So it'd be fantastic, I think, if more people started spreading that in different ways uh, so it could uh, build mm -hmm. the, that variety because I mean, that, that's, uh, to me, that's the beauty of open source is you get so many people using things in so many different ways. It just really improves the product experience for everybody, even if some ways you use it will never be the same way I use it. Uh, mm -hmm. It still just benefits uh, the code overall. So, uh, so I, I hope that you can find a way to make that work, even if it's uh, having some Indian support to... Uh, uh, then maybe they can, once they're familiar, maybe they'll support it in, uh, in that area. Right. I asked them and they've done some viewfind install, uh, but they haven't done the. And so that's why I've kind of wondered whether Bywater is holding this as sort of a pro pro proprietary uh, development thing or whether they're just able to speed ahead as a single organization and then eventually sort of delve it out to the, to the broader community or the broader community will be included or something. You know, I mean, like I said, it, it is published and they've been collaborating with PTFS Europe. So it, it, it is out there. Uh, but I think what has happened is the majority of the development is coming from Bywater because the lead developer, Mark, uh, he, uh, he basically create, took Viewfind and turned it into what it looks, what Aspen looks like now. So he's really pushed it along. Uh, uh, with a lot of momentum, uh, but I see. that is not sustainable for the rest of time. You want you don't want all your eggs in one development basket. So uh, when he was doing this independently, uh, we waited until he went with Bywater before we switched over there, just because now there's other you know knowledge and support and right. all that uh, and. Again, the more this becomes grows worldwide, the more it will look like Koha, where it's and, and even though Koha is global, there's still a finite amount of people that are actually writing code on it. Uh, so uh, <laughs> uh, I, I wonder if that part of that's because it's Perl and you know not there's not like a huge list of uh, Perl developers out there looking to do library work, but uh, maybe that'll be a little bit different in, uh, with Aspen Discovery. Well, our, our vision has been, um, our budding vision has been to have an institutional repository like vSpace or something and, and Koha with a discovery layer on top of it. And um, so that's why I'm kind of trying to sort it all out before I make, before we kind of, get momentum in a particular direction. But sometimes if you just wait on things like the Aspen development, it gets better. <laughs> so if you can drag your feet for a year or two, you know, then, then it's a little more easy to, to work with. 
That's for yeah. our institution. We have an institutional repository and now we have the consortium of libraries and we're wanting a way to combine. We looked at Aspen. We don't have the money for support. We're trying to figure out how we can get it. Um, we tried our local IT guys to install it and it required, it was above their, mm. ability. Mm. It, it, they said it, it, it takes someone who knows what mm. they're doing. There's not enough That's it. Yep. yet. Right. Or just anybody to install it. So the yeah. learning, the learning curve. <laughs> they they um, all they say they say it's a no brainer, but really it's not a no brainer. Well, and that's my sort of frustration with it. I put the the repository in the chat, but there's and and that's like the code because he he updated it yesterday. Um, but there's not any sort of documentation on how to actually spin it up. Um, so I'm hoping that over time that comes out and it's easier um because right now i wouldn't know what to do with it but it would be nice to be able to just set up a junker server spin it up and see if i can make it work with our system without paying for support um so i do get where you're kind of it, it does sort of feel like it's a biowater proprietary thing right now um and when we were first introduced to aspen back in pueblo i think we talked with mark about it but we can even really see the code on GitHub. So it is, it's getting there, it's improving, but I think what Bob mentioned of how it's sort of, it's just now starting to grow. Um, so yeah, I'm hopeful that it, it becomes a thing that can be played with more easily uh, in the not too distant future as more people pick it up. And that's one of the things that I was gonna add is that my, one of my, biggest reasons that we haven't, uh, there are a couple of reasons we haven't switched to Aspen yet, but that's been one of my biggest reasons is the lack of any kind of documentation. Um, you, there's, there's no instructions and in install, there's, there's no, that's one thing that Koha does have really well is there's that good set of documentation that's been built on for years and years and years. And yeah, I think what has happened is they're growing so fast that they haven't caught up with some of that documentation. And uh, they've actually expanded that team quite a bit, but they're still growing at a rate where uh, where that, that that's they haven't caught up with a lot of those things. So at some point, I expect that will happen. I guess it's possible that they could continue to grow at an astronomical rate and uh, it'll be a while before we catch up, but at some point I imagine it'll slow a bit. I think um, one of the things that uh, one of the unsung heroes of Koha documentation is Nicole, uh, who used to work for Bywater, that uh, she Engard. was, yeah, Nicole Engard, and she did, uh, I mean, she practically wrote the entire Koha documentation herself, because that's all she did. Um, when she would go out on training, she would go and she would train and then she would go back to her motel room and write documentation all night. Um, she was just on all the time with that. So, mm -hmm. but uh, the other thing that'll help too is the more people that adopt it, you know, now that Koha, now that Nicole is no longer with Bywater and she's off doing things with Red Hat and, or I'm not even sure she's there anymore, but she's out doing other things. The Koha community had to step up and create a documentation process. And that's what um, I think will help with Aspen is when there are enough people using it and enough people willing to document how they're using it to sit down and create uh, a good documentation team like we currently have now with Koha. Yeah, and it, it just seems like some of the structures aren't in place. Like I know I talked to somebody and all of the bug tracking is happening within Bywater system. Um, so I'd love yeah. to see that sort of exposed the same way Koha does bug tracking. Um, and I know that's that's just part of the growth of, of the product, but it's also frustrating <laughs> for people that don't have it because you can't see inside without um, access. I think that'd be something maybe you and I could say to Bywater is, you know, we're not interested in it until we can see how the bugs are tracked and uh, you know, if, if enough people say, you know, we want to see the community uh, and how the community works before we're willing to 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 adopt it, that might be a. a I think that's good leverage. feedback. 
I can run it by Mark too. He actually happens, even though we're talking this on a global uh, level, he ha happens to live in the same subdivision in the same town I live in, <laughs> and he'll he's wow. coming over for dinner in about a week and a half. So I'll, <laughs> I can wow. I can throw this at him. So. Hey, Rochelle, I wanted to check in with you. I know we, we've been talk, 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 and see if you had any questions that stirred. Uh, no, no questions, just absorbing it all so that I can uh, hopefully retain a little bit for later okay. questions. Sounds good. <laughs> Thank you. So well, there is oh, go ahead, Nelson. another quick comment that I don't have a link, but I'll try to come up with one. There's a guy, maybe you've seen, seen or aware of him, who's in Pakistan, who's been doing videos uh, for um, various aspects of, of, of Koha, and he might, he does really great videos. The, the, the pace with which he lays out the information and shows it has a little bit of a sense of humor, and it's, it's really, it's really good, um, but he also is a, a open for a bit of you know, if you if you pay him a little something, he'll do a video on it and then post it on YouTube for the world to, to have. So I've I've been enjoying that as a resource. We we largely used to rely on the documentation that existed, but um, that is in I mentioned our prison libraries earlier. Uh, they their clerks are all. Uh, are all uh, offenders. So they don't get access to YouTube and things like that. So we've been having to uh, create our own content and have it funnel through their the, the systems tech department to like land on in particular folders that they have access to. So we've been uh, getting more into producing that uh, content lately. Could I ask one more question? It's not really a consortial yep. question. Uh, so, you know, you're talking about the uh, the record grouping feature that's available in Aspen. I uh, the an immediate concern that we're going to have is just on a very uh, limit. Well, it's extensive across the catalog, but it's only like two records. So you've got a better quality uh, bib record and a lesser quality bib record, and you'd like to overlay. Uh, you basically like to move the item. To the better quality bib record. That's not possible, is it? The, the, there's a merge in Koha. It depends on which version, because I think some of those are more recent versions. The merging's gotten a lot better and easier to do. But yeah, you 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 can merge just off a search. If you search by like a title and you see two exact things, you can check box them and uh, and do a merge from there. Yeah, or that's easy. Just, or can you just move the item record? Yeah, that's even easier. Bib record. Yeah. yeah, you can do that. You, you there's a in the edit when you're in a record, there's an attach item, yeah. and then you just uh, copy and paste a barcode over. Great. And if it's the last barcode on the record that you're moving the item from, it'll ask you, "Do you want us to delete the crap record?" And that's great. Yeah. That's so. Great. Thank you. That's terrific to know. I have uh, 51 libraries and a lot of people that are not um, that are not skilled librarians. They're um, they're you know a lot of our libraries are part time libraries. The director is a 18 hour a week employee, and so that seems like half of my support requests are you know somebody added you know I've got six records for this new book. Can you merge them? Um, I do a lot of that. That's uh, I've been off since last Friday and I just checked my email and I've got like 12 requests for, could you merge these? I pro hopefully, hopefully like six of them are all for the same record, but we'll have to see. It might, it's with my luck, it'll be 12 individual merges that need to happen. Yeah. Whenever we get a request for a merge, somebody's like, could you check out this title? Looks like there might be a merge and usually, you know, it's like, oh yeah, there's, they identified two things that could merge, but there's really four records that could be merged. And then there's like 
another edition that could be merged with another record. And then the, the audio book needs to be merged as well. And then you, you kind of look at it and you're just like, okay, yeah, this is the next 40 minutes of my day is just going to be repeating this search over and over again, doing some merges, then, uh, you know, repeating it until uh, finally it gets condensed into like the, the five separate records it, it should be versus the 25 it used to be. I asked them to send me the URL from the staff client for each record they want me to merge. But I also have the opposite situation where I need to unmerge things where people will uh, attach the video to the uh, yeah that's to the paperback and that's another that can be more of a pain. <laughs> yeah, that's a pain too. I get a lot. I get not as many of those as I get merges, but I get a lot of those where you know how come there's a video on this record? Yeah, that's. How come I don't know, George, if you've done that. We don't typically train people or tell them anything about merging other than to uh, let us know to do it for them. For them Nobody, purpose. yeah, I have the merge, the merge controls are, are all hidden. So I'm, I'm really the only one, the Neckles office is the only place where that has access to that. Otherwise, otherwise there would be one record, there would be one bib record for Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer but with all of the all of them on one record uh, or things that in translation they would all be the same record dante's inferno there would be one dante's inferno it doesn't matter who the translator is anything like that yeah so those are fun things for shell to think about when you're coming together is who's going to be <laughs> the catalog police oh that would be me <laughs> there's only three of us so <laughs> yeah, i'm one so of those 18 hours a week directors <laughs> um one question and i could have asked this before but i forgot the answer um do you share online resources and how do you share so how do you have it so right now we have an e-library um, that all of our online resources are, that's how you can filter them out in the search results. That's how we've chosen to share it. Is there a better way for a local library to have an e-resource that's available to everybody? Does anyone else have that problem or? The only things we put into our catalog as a general rule are things that are shared throughout the catalog. So if, if it's in the catalog, that means it's available for everybody pretty much, so. Is the only way you could limit, so like if you were in, if they chose their individual library, would they have access, would they be able to find the search results for a e-resource that's in a different library? Uh, we don't have the catalog limited that way either. So if, if, if you do a search in the catalog, you see everybody's stuff. So we don't have a situation where people don't see, people from one library don't see things. Uh, we don't have that situation. So, so th this is how we use Aspen Discovery because some libraries have like Hoopla and most don't. Everybody has cloud library, but only some have OverDrive. So you're able to configure that per URL, per each location, uh, what gets seen and what doesn't. So that's how we, we, we have to handle that. Yeah, now that would be nice for us because we do have some library, you know, all of our libraries have Hoopla. Mm -hmm. um, not all of our libraries have OverDrive. Uh, so it would be nice to, for the libraries that do have OverDrive to be able to put that in the catalog and not only do they do some libraries have overdrive and some libraries don't but some libraries have different overdrive collections and others uh, most of our overdrive libraries are on the state of kansas uh, sunflower e-library so um but yeah that would that would be a nice thing to add with aspen but currently that's not we don't have that so yeah, if they're using like Overdrive Advantage, you just need the key and you put that in and they get those additional titles uh, that the rest of the consortium might not have. So 
it is actually fairly easy to configure. One of the things though that we try to do, you know, I that is one of the things I like about the Koha OPAC and, you know, our philosophy is that it's all shared. It's all stuff. It's all about sharing. And so um, our catalog is open to everybody in the same way. And I think having separate catalogs makes things more complicated um, for the, for the basis of sharing. That would be an issue for us is that for years and years and years and years and years, all of our library cards um, at almost that almost all of our patrons have have one catalog address on it, and uh, so saying to some people, saying to it, it would be a situation where saying to people, your live the catalog is the address that's printed on the back of your card, that would need to stop if we, uh, and and those you know. 150,000 people that already have cards would need to be told that's not the address anymore. So or for your library, go to this other address if you wanna see what's specifically at your library, so. Okay, thanks. Well, we've got a couple minutes left. Are there any other uh, questions or topics? I know that uh, for those of us that are uh, by bywater supported, uh, I just we just scheduled our upgrade to 2011 for August 1st. So I don't know if either of you, any of you, have done that yet. Ours is August 8th, so I'll listen to your horror stories and decide if we need to stop it. <laughs> we'll go last. We always go last. Nichols this, always goes last. This is a. Um... A first for us, but we're going to be an early adopter, so we're doing it end of June. Um, and the main reason we're doing that is because we have a migration that happens right mm. in August, and so we wanted to get them. We didn't want to have a upgrade right after they migrated, and so we're getting to do two two new things for me this year. So that's that's exciting. Yeah, we we've done early adopter before. We had one bad experience that wouldn't necessarily have been prevented had we waited just because of the way we're set up is different from other consortia so it still might have happened anyway but um but mostly it's like we they don't when they actually go over some of the training on new features it happens so it happens after you would uh, you would actually have it live on production and that just doesn't work. We don't have enough staff to go through each bug uh, and look at each each thing that's coming and you know really think about it and test it out. And that would be under the assumption that they still gave us enough time on the sandbox to do that. But it feels like this time we're gonna have more time on the sandbox than we've ever had. So I hopefully they're ironing out some of those uh, issues where, the webinars are a little earlier, the sandbox time is longer, so we can actually uh, get a look at it before it's uh, before it's in production and we're just seeing what happens. I also talked to Margaret this week and she said they're working on putting together test plans and things like that, that you can actually, so you can actually have a framework for what what things you want, need to test rather than trying to go through and test oh, everything. That's fantastic, she didn't mention that to me, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. My experience is it's always the thing that nobody thinks of is the thing that breaks. Yeah. Uh huh. But yeah, it's, she she told me the same thing, and they're trying to come up with ways to like encourage more people to use their test servers. So, um, it sounds like they're they're hitting it harder this time. But yeah, it it's always something that no one finds that that's the biggest thorn. I or it's always it. something where the system preference, this system preference and this system preference, if they're both set the same way, mm -hmm. then that's what breaks something. And you're the only library that's ever set them in that configuration right. before. Yeah. yeah, our big thing was that they just changed the way that, like I was mentioning earlier, how slow our holds load when there's a lot of items. That just has to do with them trying to load that in a different way that had some appeal, but it just takes more resources to load it that way. So that's what, you know, I'm sure who, whomever was testing it wasn't testing it on a record that had 80 items attached. 
so they're like hey this still works great and then all of a sudden like uh, it, initially it was uh, crashing our whole system every time somebody tried to place a hold, which was uh, a bad couple of days until they wrote that fix, <laughs> that bug fix. I think it was three point, Koha 3.8, grace period stopped working. And that was when Bywater decided we're not going to go to the brand new version and we're not mm -hmm. going to go to uh, stable. We're going to always put our customers on old stable because that way we'll have had six months to work out all the bugs. I don't know if Jason remembers that, but we had every day I had to go in and generate a run a report to see who got fines that were undeserved. Yeah, we didn't have that big of a problem because we don't use grace periods that much. Every single library at the system I worked at then had a grace, had a, had fines and a grace period. So it was a lot of a little bit. It was a lot of extra work. It was a ton of extra work. It was, uh, it was messed up. All right. Well, I think we're at time. So I'll thank everybody for the great discussion. Uh, the next one is going to be on the regularly scheduled time pending something coming up as things tend to come up. Uh, so that will be, uh, do I have it on my calendar? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I thought I had it on my personal calendar, but it's probably on the Koha calendar because uh, we should be doing every other month. So it should be in July. Oh, there it is, the tw July 28th, same time. Same link, all that's the same. So uh, please join us again for more discussion. See you all later.